Cool. Okay. So uh, thanks for thanks for listening. Um, yeah, I'm scared. Oh, do you? Yeah. So. Oh, it's okay. I got it. All right. So yeah, this is our kind of brief agenda for today. Um, we're just going to do like a really quick overview of the critical keys in a sigsaw deployment, and we're going to talk about how we. Um, selected an open source solution to build uh, a transparent community rooted um, security and update mechanism for those keys um, for Sigstore. So we've heard a bit already, Sigstore's GA now, and um, some observers might kind of worry that this is a, a high value target for the increasing number of supply chain security attacks. Um, Sigstore is underpinned by the magic of cryptography, which you can see um, on the diagram. Most of the first party components uh, have um, <coughs> various cryptographic uses in Sigstore, and <coughs> in any given Sigstore deployment, several of those components are going to rely heavily on public key, public key cryptography. Um, so, for example, the, the Fulcio uh, Certificate Authority, um, every certificate generated is derived from a, uh, a root certificate, um, then once you've generated those certificates, they're put into a transparency log, and the transparency log uh, issues a promise, a signed promise, that the certificate really is going to be stored there. Uh, because this is an eventually consistent system, you're not going to be able to immediately query the system for the, um, the event you've just recorded. Um, similarly, recall issues uh, similarly, signed promises that uh, some metadata has been stored in the log there. And then we have the artifact signing keys, which um, give an, an indication of authenticity of a six or project release. So these are all super important um, keys that we want to make sure um, aren't put to malicious use. Um, and anyone following tech headlines over recent years <clears throat> has probably seen that when crypto systems get broken, it's not the cryptography that gets broken. It's the human processes uh, and the humans involved that um, ultimately you know, result in problems. Um, I've included a few demonstrative headlines on the slides, uh, and these were just the ones that were easy to find thanks to CNCF Tag Security. They maintain a neat supply chain compromise catalog. Um, I'm really not meaning to pick on anyone specifically, uh, this genuinely happens to pretty much everyone who tries to manage cryptographic keys uh, over a long period of time. And in addition to kind of the human processes uh, that often have result in problems like this, Sigstore is fairly operationally unique, I think. Um, not only is Sigstore a project you can kind of install on your own platform and run your own instance of, but there's this public good instance that we've heard a bit about. And the public good instance um, is a free-to-use service. It's hosted by a not-for-profit. There's multiple organizations, multiple stakeholders involved in running this infrastructure, and many of those may be considered kind of competitors. Um, and as alluded to, this is a really high-value service. So when we think about how we manage the keys for this service, uh, we really need a solution that mitigates all of the implicit risks, right? No one operator should be privileged only over any of the others. Um, they shouldn't be able to make changes without um, some kind of approval process. Um, and the service really needs to be resilient to compromise. Uh, the effect of any compromise should be minimized, and it, it must be possible to recover the service. So given this really high-level background, um, I'm going to hand over to Frederick, to kind of make some of the requirements more concrete. Yeah, thank you, Osha. So I'm just going to wait for some slide adjustments here. And then let's switch with that one. Yeah, so uh, as we've seen, there are some services we need to secure in the system, like there are a lot of keys going around. So. To be able to manage this in a secure way, we have identified a few of the requirements. So as an example, we need to be able to rotate or revoke a single key at any given time. So this could be like a key can be compromised, so it has to be revoked, or it could be due to a schedule rotation, because nothing is forever and especially not in trust. All the trees, all the keys has to be 
uh, single purpose use only, so if a specific key is compromised, the effect of it should be minimized. Over time, the number of keys will grow, so we need to have a solution that's capable of managing a growing set of keys, because keys that are rotated may still be used because we need to verify a signature made in the past. Also, for a good developer experience, the solution needs to have a way where we can sort of understand programmatically what the intended use case and status is for a specific key. All the keys has to be um, related to a trust group so the client can verify them because the client don't just want to accept a key and then trust it, so it has to be verifiable in that sense, kind of similar to how a root certificate works for uh, regular certificates. The trust route has to be very strong to protect against things such as uh, a compromised key, so we need to have a quorum of trust route members approving all the changes to it. All the changes happening has to be verifiable and visible to the community so they can see what's happening. And of course, it has to be traced back to an initial trust route. And a client that's working with a specific trust route has to be able to bootstrap itself up to the latest version as well. So this chosen solution for this is the update framework, or TUF. So TUF, as we already heard from Ethan, is a framework for securing software update systems. It's an open source project. It's been around for a long time, and it's widely used and tested and, and widely tested and used in a lot of production deployments. Some of the important things that you get from TUF is that it describes, for instance, what are the steps to securely verify an update from a client side perspective what are the file formats used, or metadata files, as they're called. So each metadata file uh, corresponds to a specific role. We will talk a little bit more about roles, but each metadata file is signed and has an expiration date, and two of the important roles are the root role, which defines what are the keys in the system and what are the roles. Another important um, metadata file is the target file that shows what are the targets that exist in the system, and the targets is what the client is really interested in. So for us, it's a key, usually. Uh, from public key infrastructure, TUF does not rely on anything you might already have on your existing host. So instead, when you're shipping a TUF client, you're expected to also ship a trust route. And of course, TUF can work with that TUF trust route and update itself to the latest version. So some of the key features of it is that, as we mentioned, like all metadata files can have uh, a threshold in the amount of signatures you need to have. So this is a good way to protect against a compromise key or, let's say, an insider attack. Uh, TUF doesn't care about what the target is. It's sort of a opaque for TUF. It just delivers them, but it does offer the possibility to add custom metadata to it so you can get some kind of semantic or understanding of the targets. We talked about two roles, but roles is a way where you can distribute different responsibilities within TUF itself. So Two other important roles are the snapshot role and the timestamping role. So as Ethan said on the talk earlier, the snapshot role is used to gather all the set of valid targets together, and this acts as a good way to prevent mix and match attacks. The timestamping role is used to periodically resign the snapshot file, so this is a way we can get protection for replay attacks. So as an example, how it may look like is that you might have your different metadata files somewhere in a offline place and you can sign them and then they get published to a repository where the client can fetch them from. So as an example, the repository may be like an HTTP server or a cloud blob storage. And from there, all the clients can sort of pull down the latest version of all the targets and the metadata file describing them. To end this off, I would just like to show that there are some honorable deployments already of TUF, and being in Detroit, I would like to call out Uptain, which is a derived work from TUF used to secure updates for automobiles. And with that said, I would like to hand it over to Asra. All right, um, thanks, Frederick. So I'm going to start uh, talking a little bit more about implementation details and about our SIG store specific instance of TUF. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this red highlighted left part about the repository setup and the implementation of how we're creating this repository. So the first thing is given the requirements that um, Frederick mentioned and the ecosystem that Joshua mentioned that we need to secure, um, what we've done is we've used the update framework to secure with um, the targets actually pointing to those ecosystem signing keys. So all those four targets 
um, that Joshua mentioned are actually the targets that we're signing off on. Um, and Tough is that framework that is going to provide us with the freshness aspect um, and the rest of the attack mitigations that Frederick spoke of. Um, the second thing is, in order to share the community ownership of the public trust route um, and to allow the public to view the records, um, part of you know, the transparency ideology of SIGSTOR, is that we actually host the trust route and all of the actions for signing and um, changes on the GitHub repository. So that GitHub repository is SIGSTOR slash root signing, um, and from there you can see all the records of history, new updates, um, and uh, like basically audit trails of what's been going on there. So we encourage you to go check that out. If you're ever curious about if there's a root event occurring, you'll find out there. So diving in a little bit deeper into the um, layout of the six-door community route, um, what we have here is a visualization of the, the four major roles in red and green, and then the four artifacts um, that are signed by the targets. Um, so we have two different types of keys that are used in managing the six-door community route. The first is those offline keys, and the second is online keys. So the offline keys um, are distributed amongst five community key holders. So unfortunately, we have four in the same room, maybe <laughs> here right now. Um, Bob, Santiago, Joshua, and Dan, and Marina Moore from uh, NYU, who's not here. So those five key holders each hold a, an offline HSM key that is used to sign the green uh, metadata files, root, and targets. Um, the online keys are hosted on Cloud KMS and have uh, configured with specifically workload identity from the GitHub repository to actually do the signing. So with that, I want to just first dive into how we got into this whole root system in the first place. So I described to you the stable picture of what the current root looks like, but in order to actually create that, we needed an initial trust root, which um, I think Frederick mentioned earlier. So a root key ceremony or a signing key party um, is a ceremony that actually generates that initial bootstrappable trust. Um, and one of the things that it does is pro provide uh, ownership proof um, with all those HSM keys. So, you know, Bob's kind of shady, Joshua's kind of shady, Dan's kind of shady, all these people are kind of shady. So you, you need a sort of system of actual trusting them that they created those keys from the HSMs we delivered them um, and that they weren't created in some sort of uh, tamperable manner in which they can go and uh, you know post it on the internet or something. Um, so that gives us key ownership proof and also key integrity proof. Um, and then likewise, because we're using Tough, we get this bootstrappable process where each update we make is traced back to the previous, which means we only needed one initial key signing ceremony. Um, so key signing ceremonies, they're not, um, they're not new. Uh, they've happened before. Um, but that key difference is like, for example, in the Cloud for DNS sec, they hold a key signing ceremony every year because they don't use Tough. Um, so we don't need to do a key signing live stream ceremony every single year. We just needed to do that single one. Um, another shout out is PyPI did a live stream um, for the Tough Root in PEP 458. Uh, we were heavily inspired for the layout of that and the runbook um, that are all linked over there. Um, so without that, we honestly wouldn't have had a sort of guide runbook um, to create ours. So going into this, um, this is the layout of how those operations are actually performed. So there's kind of five rounds here. Um, and each are either done through offline manner because we have to have some sort of offline um, procedure for the, the keys that are managed with the YubiKeys. And then the rest is managed through automated GitHub processes. Um, so a quick story is like we were limited to one hour for the live stream initial route. Um, and I was doing like tons and tons of tests. Um, Priya, Dan, Apu, uh, Jake were all involved in helping me run through this um, dry run for the live stream. And we realized we only got through that first five boxes, those add root keys during that entire hour, because um, we were doing everything in um, a serialized process. And then we realized there's no way that that can happen. We need to sort of be able to do all these offline um, operations in parallel. So the layout looks something like this. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, uh, let me quickly give an overview of how the actual route is managed in the whole process. So we go from those key holders who perform those ceremony operations, that gets pushed up to that GitHub route where everything is reviewed, validated, and then committed. Then that triggers GitHub actions to actually do the deployment process up to our remote. So we host our re remote currently on GCS, so all of you six door clients are probably familiar with finding that endpoint. Um, and then from there, users can discover the next update. 
And then finally, one quick last thing um, I want to mention is a little bit more about that um, usability or customization that we, um, we do for clients. So in the six store tough target layout, um, what we have here is some pieces of custom metadata because otherwise those targets that you're shipping to clients are totally black boxes. Um, they're just byte payloads that we're delivering in a secure manner, but clients have no idea whether this was meant for Fulcio or whether this was meant for Recore um, or whether this was intended for signing as in the current active shard or this may be an old shard that we're using for verifying old targets signed a year ago. Um, and then likewise, we can also provide some other hinting material to um, you know, what that target was actually uh, used for. So it, the metadata looks something like this under the custom six store piece. Um, right now we have you know, that status of active or inactive, the URI that it was associated to, and then that usage piece which determines which component it was actually attached to. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Joshua now to talk about the client aspect and the ingestion and pieces that are more relevant to six store clients. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked, yeah, about, about how we uh, operate the repository, we want clients to be able to interact with the repository and retrieve the keys, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the high-level process uh, to do that. So um, when we are implementing clients, the first thing we want is um, an implementation of the tough specifications uh, client workflow. This gives us all of the standard tough promises. Uh, do I know, you know, a client knows when keys have changed, a client knows uh, that they have the whole set of keys, a consistent set of keys, and the client knows whether the keys are correct, whether there's been any data corruption or tampering with the, um, the data in transit or on disk. Um, and we really uh, want the client to be able to do this in a way that's transparent to users. We don't want users to have to worry about any kind of key management and triggering updates of the keys. Um, and we think it's reasonably simple as well for client implementations, especially when there's an existing uh, kind of tough uh, implementation for the ecosystem you're using. But the specification lays out um, in quite a detailed fashion uh, the workflow that we expect clients to follow. Um, so as well as the standard uh, tough client features, Sigstar has some uh, additional requirements um, that Azra has uh, detailed how we uh, describe those on the client side, um, sorry, on the repository side. Um, and that is, a client really wants to know what the target's used for. Uh, is the key still active? Is it valid for um, recently signed data only? Uh, recently signed data or for um, historical signed data only? And some notion of policy, whether uh, this is the public good six-store instance, a staging instance, a proprietary uh, instance on private infrastructure. Um, and in addition to the features of a tough client, we really want a six-store client to be um, able to do additional things because the nature of where six-store clients are deployed is um, varied and the frequency of use of a six-store client is different to um, kind of some more traditional signing solutions. So. Once you've got clients at the edge or in ephemeral environments, we, we want to be able to have some notion of configurability. Am I, um, I don't want to necessarily update my key material every time I um, ingest a new container image. Um, I might want a certain notion of cacheability. Um, and we really do need uh, clients to ship with that initial trust route so that they can um, have that verified linkage from uh, a trusted state that the client verified. Um, we really want to avoid trust on first use um, for six star clients. So concretely, this comes down to three things that clients need to implement. Um, they need to bundle a copy of that trusted root metadata. Um, they need to perform the steps of the tough metadata update workflow. Uh, and then finally, they need to be able to search for matching keys. And right now, that's uh, looking at the JSON metadata that you've retrieved and doing basically a, a wildcard match of pattern match on the, the names of the target files, the key files. Um, but we're, we're currently working to define uh, a more robust target discovery mechanism um, so that each client doesn't have to uh, manually inspect the metadata. Um, we want to define more of an API contract for this kind of work. Um, and I'm really 
I think it's really neat to be able to share this information. If you are interested in implementing a SIGSTOR client, there's a bunch of libraries that exist today that can make it much easier for you. Um, you don't need to start from scratch in most instances. Uh, if you are uh, using Go, obviously, there's the, um, the cosine implementation that is available in the SIGSTOR module on GitHub, um, and that implements everything we've described here today. There's also a uh, Rust client uh, that's available on crates.io called six.rs. Um, the Python client is in progress. We're gonna hear about that a little bit more later today. Uh, it doesn't currently implement the rookie update mechanism, but there is some uh, discussion about implementing that and you can get the Python client today on PyPI and um, you know, sign and verify uh, six door signatures. Um, there's also a Java client uh, available on Maven and um, a JavaScript client, which is available on NPM, uh, doesn't yet do the root key update either, um, but there's, there's ongoing work for that. And I should note that the Go client is the only one that doesn't include some kind of disclaimer about this being kind of experimental working progress code. This is the, the little warning symbols on the diagram on the slide here. Um, but I think given the GA today, uh, we can expect to see these kind of rapidly approaching stabilization, and I would strongly encourage that this is a great place to um, bring your kind of software engineering um, ecosystem knowledge and start contributing to the six door space. The more of these clients we can get um, implementing these features and stabilize, then the, the easier six door adoption will be moving forward. And then as promised, this was a very fast tour through uh, the, the root signing mechanism and how to interact with that repository. So we collected a, a list of resources here that you can use to dig deeper into some of the things we've discussed today. I really want to highlight some talks happening today and at the rest of the conference. So uh, Jed and Zach are going to be giving a talk on the life of the Sigsaw signature. I think that's gonna be super useful context uh, on top of this. Um, and then um, at the main KubeCon event, there's going to be a maintainer track talk about Tuff. So if you really want to uh, here's some of the deeper details on Tuff you can see um, Justin and Marina talk about that. And then uh, Santiago and Justin, uh, Santiago and Marina, sorry, are going to be hosting a Contrib Fest on Sigstar and Tuff and in Toto during KubeCon. Um, and probably most of us are gonna be there, so if you want to come and hack on some of this stuff, like come along and we can, we can get more technical with some of this and dig into the details. Um, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, we have a few minutes. If you've got questions, we'd be more than happy to answer them. All right, I'm going to hand you the mic for the first question. I can stage a question. Of <laughs> course. I, I don't have one because I'd probably eat it, <laughs> but. No, we, we didn't want to make this the cheapest wrench attack <laughs> against the six-star infrastructure. Okay, I'm gonna pause it a question um, because I think it's important. So probably some of you are asking, well, this is an online mechanism. What do I do for offline verification or, or air-gapped environments? Um, and so I'm going to like maybe quickly touch on that is that a lot of us are thinking about that already um, and that while Tuff is an online protocol and you require doing online updates in order to achieve the full set of security properties. It's possible to configure um, you know, your timestamp and uh, other updates to be a little bit longer, to have cacheability, um, to put workloads that are mirroring that tough route internally. Um, so there's a lot of solutions that we're thinking about in this case, um, but I kind of want to emphasize that you do lose some security properties when you go offline. Um, and that's expected, it's just something to note. Yeah, I was going to, yeah. So the question was effectively, um, when you're deploying your own six-star instance, when do you need to go through all of this kind of process to generate your own tough route? Um, and one of the things we've been talking about this week, in fact, is um, like abstracting the tough route into a generic kind of route interface with defined uh, contract points so that um, you can 
you don't always need to use tough. Uh, if you're a relatively small company, you know, you've got like tens of engineers, having this quorum mechanism uh, maybe doesn't make sense. And the, the sense of ownership um, is much clearer in a hierarchical organization. The, the transparent uh, trust is probably not a relevant notion. Um, so we want to make it easier to bring your own uh, kind of um, root key mechanism and bootstrap your signature instance from those controlled using your existing mechanisms or a simpler mechanism. So when does it make sense? I really think the, the kind of the transparency and the quorum uh, are, are two of the key things in the root selling system that we've designed. And um, being able to chain uh, like the updates is a really powerful mechanism. Um, so I don't think I can give a concrete answer when it makes sense, uh, just that we're thinking about this and we'd like to support different scenarios. And I think also there's some work starting to make it easier to uh, generate your own tough route without necessarily having to follow the same process that we use um, on the public instance. Do you want to add anything over? Yeah, I think um, on that note, we are trying to make it easier for you to make a lightweight tough setup that may only be used for like you know a single maintainer creation. So um, there's some work on uh, coming out of VMware on repository workflows and um, on the on tough maintainers as well are, are looking at that. And there's also some work uh, that uh, Vlay had had done in six for scaffolding as well to create uh, tough routes from secrets that you can load in. So we're working on that. But again, it might not make sense for you to have a, a public trust route that's uh, like securely updated sometimes. So anything else? All right, well, feel free to approach any of us about any of this um, and, you know, attend the Contrib Fest as well. We'll def honestly, maybe someone can do the six-store Python integration and complete it there. <laughs> it should be pretty easy. Okay, awesome. Thank you.